thank you everyone for joining us today. My name's Jen from the EcoL. If you're unfamiliar with our platform, we're a science communication platform where we give voices to scientists in and around the cosmetic space. And I'm super excited about this panel. I've been wanting to have a panel on this topic for a while now. And with me, I've got some really great panelists. So beauty from within, a scientific outlook. We're approaching the topic from many vantages, the perspective of a dermatologist, dietitian and a scientist and a science communicator in the cosmetic space. And just so you guys know, this conversation will be published right away on our YouTube channel and eventually it'll make its way onto our podcast. And with me today is Dr. Anjali Mato. You may know her already from some of our previous panels. She's a consultant dermatologist, author of the Skincare Bible, spokesperson for the UK's largest skin charity, the British Skin Foundation, and an executive committee member of the British Cosmetics Dermatology Group. Andrea Hardy is a Canadian registered dietitian. She specializes in gut health ga and gastrointestinal diseases and is recognized in the media as Canada's gut health expert. And then finally, Perry Romanowski, who's filling in for Valerie today. He's an independent cosmetic chemist, previous president of the Society of Cosmetic Chemists, Psycomer and co-host of the Beauty Brains, and so my thanks for having me. Thanks, thanks to all to the panelists, and then again, thanks for everyone for tuning in. And so my first question is directed, I guess, to all of you guys. Does what we eat have a significant impact on the appearance of our skin? Are there foods that we should be specifically avoiding or including, as is commonly recommended online? What does the evidence show us so far? What do you think? Anyone want to dive in first? The nutritionist should start, huh? <laughs> I can jump in first. So uh, in regards to nutrition and skin, uh, I think there's a lot of things that are overstated around how nutrition influences the skin. There's definitely a lot of dietary components that play a role in how our skin integrity is maintained. But a lot of that research is specifically around deficiencies. And so when we're eating a varied, balanced diet, we're getting a variety of different macronutrients and micronutrients that help support our skin health. Um, I always like to draw people's attention specifically to acne because that's a hot topic. Uh, but we do know that uh, blood sugar management and certain hormones that are involved in managing our blood sugars may influence um, androgen production, which can drive uh, acne. Um, and this can be especially relevant in patients with PCOS, for example. So bottom line, what it really comes down to is your specific uh, diagnoses, uh, how you eat, and then, you know, could these things influence your skin? In general, I like to say, you know, for following a healthy, balanced diet, we're doing a good job taking care of our skin. Anjali, do you want to dive in next? Yeah. So, I mean, from my point of view, I always like to kind of get rid of the idea that there could be a superfood for your skin. You know, you often pick up magazine articles or you're spreading social media and people will say these top five foods for your skin health. There are no superfoods for skin. And whilst there are lots and lots of nutrients that we know are good for skin health, so completely echoing what you just said, you know, we know that omega-3 is essential for skin. We know that vitamin A, vitamin C, all of those types of things we need. But what I would always kind of like to emphasize is that a diet that is good for your general health, that is good for your eyes and your lungs and all other organ systems of the body is the same diet that is good for your skin as well. Our body doesn't absorb things or nutrients by itself. It absorbs whole foods and the way that they interact with each other. So there are no superfoods. It is all about kind of healthy eating patterns over long sustained periods of time. So, you know, if you have eaten a whole lot of sugar on one day, that's not the end of the world. You know, it's more about what you're doing over 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, the course of your lifetime that you need to look at. Yeah, and I will. I would just echo that. And uh, I think the the initial answer is, is, of course, food does affect what your skin looks like. I mean, if you stop eating, your skin's not going to look good. Um, but I think what the idea that there are some specific foods that you can eat that are going to make your nails grow or your hair grow or get rid of wrinkles, that is way overblown. And that's more of a marketing story that makes sense, but probably isn't true. 
Yeah, you definitely see people pull a lot of research, maybe in animal models or just theoretically based off of what we know, um, you know, different dietary components are evolved, involved in different metabolic pathways. And then they create this like superfood supplement that has all these different things in it that they're saying is going to have this particular action on your skin when in fact, we just don't have the data to support when you take this supplement, this is the particular outcome. I think that's really, that's an important part about the data. Um, what you will find, what, what you'll generally find is that companies will take a, a small study, which is suggestive that something could actually work. And then they don't want to learn anymore. Let's just launch a product <laughs> because if you actually studied it more, you did proper studies, you might find it doesn't work and then you don't have a product to sell. Yeah, it's very, it seems very uh, disadvantageous for companies to engage in research if they've made crazy sales off of some of the, the crazy claims that are out there. I think that's right. And I think also there's been a, a kind of a real interest in how food can supplement the skin. And there's lots of even books, not just social media that you can find, you know, if you eat this food, you will be X illness in your skin or other parts of your body. And so much of it is based on kind of shaky inferences rather than proper scientific data. So just think of an example, you know, a, a small study might show that selenium and zinc are good in helping acne. The next inference that somebody will then make is, okay, well, Brazil nuts contain selenium and zinc. You take those two, both of those may well be facts, but the conclusion then that's being drawn is if you eat Brazil nuts, you will then sort your acne out. And there is so much of that when you actually like sort of drill down into the details of food and skin, it's kind of the premises that these kind of conclusions are being drawn on are so shaky and they don't follow through if you think about it. And I think maybe, I, I'm sorry, I didn't prepare you guys with this question, but I think it's pertinent to what we're talking about. There's a lot of confusion around like, what does it take to eat a healthy diet? There's a lot of confusion about this. Uh, it, it seems kind of straightforward, but I don't think it is. There's the paleo diet, there's the uh, Atkins diet, the vegan diet, the uh, whatever diet. And people are very, uh, I guess, emotionally vested in the idea that their diets are superior for whatever reason. So maybe this next question will be directed to Andrea, just like a high level overview. What is yeah. a healthy diet? So for sure, I always like to say the healthiest diet is the one you can see yourself sticking to day in and day out for the rest of your life. Of course, we want some flexibility there because food isn't just fuel. It's also enjoyment and pleasure and celebration and all those important things as well. So ultimately, a lot of the nutrition information out there is often focused on restriction. And a lot of this information specifically around skin and nutrition is also focused on restriction. And so I often see patients that come to us with really restrictive diets, um, a lot of times maybe following keto or paleo or vegan or what have you with the motivation that if I follow this diet, there, my skin will be fantastic. Um, and the problem with that is a lot of times is it's quite restrictive. It alters how we relate to food. It often creates an all or nothing mentality and food can often be moralized when we think of it in that way. And so what I like to encourage or what I say my number one job is actually is to get people to take food a little less seriously, which probably comes as a surprise coming from a dietitian. Uh, but we're just so bombarded with, you know, this food is bad for us and we should eat more of this and all of that sort of thing, uh, rather than looking at something that's a little bit more sustainable. And so when I think of what a healthy, balanced diet is for people, uh, I think a lot of times it's focusing on variety. It's getting back to trying to consume more whole foods. So uh, things like fruits and vegetables, whole grains, different sources of protein, whether that be animal or plant. And I really find like the healthy or balanced plate is a really good, simple visual to help people understand how to get that balance. So that's basically just, you know, half your plate of fruit and veggies, a quarter of your plate whole grains, a quarter of your plate proteins. Um, and then in terms of how much we eat, uh, eating when we're hungry, stopping when we're comfortably satisfied, and then making space for the gray in between. Sometimes we overeat, sometimes we undereat. That's 
all part of normal eating, but getting more attuned with your body's hunger and fullness signals is a really great way to actually figure out how much to eat. And I guess along the lines of this topic, is there a downside with straight dietary exclusion of foods? Uh, I'm thinking of like orthorexia, that's the new eating yeah. disorder, or maybe that like moral emphasis on diets. What mm -hmm. do you think? So orthorexia is a type of eating disorder where patients place extreme value or significance on what they're eating and often view certain food behaviors as like very good and then other food behaviors as very negative. So it's a very black and white, all or nothing approach to food. And when we start to place dietary restrictions around food, we often develop very rigid thinking uh, about our eating behaviors. And that can often become very disordered. Uh, nutrition can take up way more space in your brain than it should. So thinking about nutrition should be, you know, just a small piece of who you are and what you do every day. It shouldn't totally consume you. And with the amount of time people are spending on social media consuming nutrition information, it's getting really concerning that a lot of people are uh, struggling with how they relate to food um, and assuming that what they eat actually defines who they are as a person. Um, and so a lot of times patterns of dietary restriction exclusion diets um, can lead to this dysfunctional relationship with food where you're like, oh my gosh, did I eat something that had this additive in it? Oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? I'm such a bad person. Now my skin is going to be awful and I've ruined my whole week or whatever sort of negative self-talk occurs there. Uh, a lot of times people end up on a very short list of foods. They feel safe eating. And a lot of times, you know, not just from a skin perspective, from, but a digestion perspective is patients don't feel any better or see any benefit from where they started from that very liberal diet. Um, you know, I'd say probably 80, 90% of people out there struggle with some sort of uh, relation to food challenge because diet culture is so prevalent. We assume that, you know, if we control our nutrition intake, we can control all these other things, skin included. Um, when in fact, you know, nutrition is just one small piece of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it seems... from the dermatologist perspective, sorry, Perry, no, I'd, sorry. Lo I'd love to hear what you have to say, Anjali. And of course you, Perry, as well. Yeah, no, I think this is a massive issue actually in clinic. And it's definitely something I'm seeing more of, I would say in the past two to three years than even five, six, seven years ago. So I'm sure there is an issue with social media playing a role in that as well. But I have got so many patients that come to me and a lot of my practice is based around a lot of the inflammatory skin conditions. So acne, eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, and people will cut out dairy and sugar and gluten. And before you know it, it becomes a very, very slippery slope, exactly as Andrea has described, where what you're eating is so minimal. And then it becomes, I can't go out with my friends and I can't meet my friends because there's nothing on the menu that I'm going to be able to eat. So not only is it restricting and the impacts that that's going to have on one's mental health, but it can be really socially isolating as well. On top of that, you know, controlling your diet usually is not going to control an active skin disease or inflammatory skin condition. So then you often see the skin isn't getting better on any, you know, as a result of that. So then there's more self blame of, but I'm doing all of these things and my spots are still getting worse or my rosacea is still getting worse. And then that creates this narrative of self blame and that all then starts to spiral into each other. So I'm really wary actually of, of my patients that do tell me, well, I, I exclude this, 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 and this. And my first question is always, are you doing that for your skin? Is there a, a gut issue that you're doing that for? Because I think it's really important to identify it. And then it's really important to refer on to a dietitian and a psychologist, because often you do need that kind of input and that kind of multidisciplinary approach to tackle it. It seems like one of the things that I find most troubling is that people take general advice uh, that doesn't apply to them specifically and they change their life on it because you know everybody's skin and health is going to be different and just because donuts are bad for one person doesn't mean they're bad for somebody else. I, this whole notion of there being bad foods, um, I, I just don't think it's, it's, it's real and it's not something that's helpful in society really. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think way too much onus is put on nutrition to solve all of our problems when in fact, nutrition can be helpful. I, I mean, I'm a dietitian. I, I yeah. do believe yeah. that nutrition is important, but it's only one small piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and I think narratives like food is medicine, you are what you eat, you know, get that glow from X food that, you know, we, we see all that kind of stuff. And I think it's really damaging, actually, to see those kinds of messages being perpetuated because, you know, no one in their right mind is going to say food is not important. Of course, what we eat is important. It is just it's not as important as we think it is when it comes to managing skin disease. And that, that same message bleeds over from the food industry to the cosmetic industry. And now you see people marketing products that are healthy enough to eat. I don't know, like, why would you want to eat your cosmetics? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> well, and I think there's also this confusion that when people see these uh, health influencers online who have perfect skin or a perfect body from what social media shows us, that if you eat what they're eating or use the products that they're using, then you're going to look like what they do by like just following what they are. So I guess there's one part of that of like, obviously everyone's different, but then the other thing is anecdotal evidence. So what's the problem with anecdotal evidence? And we see it all the time. This diet worked for my acne or eczema or whatever else. And I, I find this is especially true in the world of nutrition. So is this form of evidence something that we should be giving a lot of weight to? I mean, I would say anecdotal evidence is like really strong uh, and people find it very compelling. Uh, when you hear that your neighbor or your friend tried this thing and it worked, their condition went away, uh, then pe people are more uh, compelled to try things out. It's, it's much more compelling to hear somebody you know or somebody you f follow on Instagram or, or YouTube that they tried a treatment and it worked and then you want to go out and try it yourself. Um, but of course, th as from a scientific standpoint or from uh, the standpoint of whether that is going to really help you, uh, it, anecdotal evidence isn't helpful at all. It's helpful to give scientists clues of what we should study, but just because you tried something, you, you were eating kale for a week and you didn't have any acne, that doesn't mean you're, that had any effect on each other. Uh, you could have ate nothing and the acne went away and then, you know, you don't know. It's, the cause and effect cannot be established through anecdotal evidence. Yeah, I think uh, there's something really powerful and persuasive for people about how people storytell and share their experience through social media. But what people aren't weighing is what is the risks of trying this? A lot of times it's impacts to our wallet. Uh, I used to work in the ICU and I saw a lot of people admitted to ICU who ordered supplements online that aren't regulated here in Canada and they ended up in liver failure or kidney failure or heart failure. So we have to consider how a person's experience may also pose us risks. Right now we're only seeing the benefit through their storytelling, but there could also be very dangerous and very real risks, not just to your wallet from a cost perspective, but you know, I, I mean, I've seen some crazy things when I worked in the ICU, simply from supplements that people ordered online in hopes that, okay, what's the harm? It's just money, I'll give it a try. That's right, actually. I mean, the supplement industry is so poorly regulated and I think people think that it, it it's safe compared to taking an oral medication. And if something goes wrong, we don't even have the data to, no to collect those numbers because we don't know how many people are taking supplements, what dose they're taking, how often they're taking them, what they're mixing them up with. And when I talk about supplements, one of the things that always comes to my mind is we don't ever really seem to see the stories about, you know, the people that took beta carotene that were smokers and had like asbestos exposure and their risk of lung cancer increased as a result of that. The people on the SELECT trial many years ago, healthy volunteers took vitamin E and selenium, increased the risk of prostate cancer. There are mouse studies, I think there was a paper in Nature back in 2015, where they gave mice antioxidants, antioxidant supplements, NAC. And what ended up happening was actually their melanoma tumor cells metastasized or spread further as a result of taking these supplements. So 
this idea that you know if you, you take a supplement that might be an antioxidant that it reduces free radical damage and therefore that's good for you it's probably so much more oversimplistic than we realize and there are probably so many things that we are missing out on at the moment where actually high doses high frequency they might actually be increasing the risk of cancer development and spread and we simply don't know so i find the whole supplements industry and how it's not regulated actually really frightening it has always surprised me that there hasn't been a campaign for safe supplements um, you find campaign for safe cosmetics but those are much more regulated and we can get into regulations a little more but uh, i don't know really why there nobody has taken this this mantle up because these products are not safe there'd be a whole, whole lot of nothing to sell if people did take it up yes. um and i think well, that's true <laughs> I think what's missed a lot of times when it comes to drawing these conclusions between things like vitamin A or selenium or that sort of thing is when we look at food versus supplements and what we constantly see in nutrition research is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. There's something special about getting our nutrition through food and a food matrix that infers a health benefit because time and time again, research has showed us that supplements don't necessarily infer a health benefit or like Anjali was saying, they potentially have the risk of causing harm. So in Canada, there is actually an organization that is going after uh, supplements that are trying to prove regulations. You probably have something in the States and probably something in Europe. I'm just not familiar with it. But in Canada, actually, in our first panel that we had, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Ryan Armstrong from Bad Science Watch. And so they're trying to improve the regulations because there's a lot of uh, misinformation and maybe bad practices that happen within that space. And there have been movement to try to, uh, so I'm only familiar with what's, what's happening in Canada, but there has been movement uh, with uh, the self-care proposal, although this has kind of changed in Canada, that's all I'm talking about, uh, where they were trying to change regulations uh, but the industry fought back. The natural health industry did fight back. So, uh, and it, you see this with the clean beauty space where sometimes it's disadvantage disadvantageous for these companies to have those further regulations and it's not something that consumers see. And then there's this all, this dialogue around like, oh, it's big pharma trying to squander the natural products. Um, there's also this idea, and you guys have been talking about this kind of loosely the whole time, but it's a regression to the mean. So you, throughout the course of your illness, will be, say, I have a blemish or something. It'll last like the blemish itself. I don't know the whole lifetime of it. So maybe, maybe a cold will be a better example. It lasts yeah. usually like a week. Okay, so then day three, kind of at the top of this curve of when you're going to start feeling better, you take a vitamin C supplement, and then you start to feel better. Now, are you feeling better because of the vitamin C supplement or because you were going to feel better anyways? And I feel that there's, or at least I hear this a lot on social media when people um, come back to me when I'm like, well, there's no evidence to support this. And then they're like, well, it worked for me like this. So it's just another layer of the anecdotal evidence may not be the best form of evidence to consider. Does anyone want to add to that? I don't know why yeah. celery juice popped into my mind when you were saying all of that. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, that I felt was all over social media a couple of years ago. I see far less of it now, but maybe it's because I've honed my feed that it doesn't hit me anymore. But that was one where people were like, well, I've started my 16 ounces of celery juice a day and my eczema has gotten better. But absolutely, the nature of a skin condition like eczema or psoriasis it is up and down and there will be good periods and bad periods. So it makes it very difficult to know, was it that dietary switch or that new cosmetic product that you bought that is making your skin better or was it gonna get better anyway? Right, or hormones or weather or yeah. whatever else is going on. And I think a really important concept that I was taught quite early in my career is something called benign neglect. And so benign neglect is really the fact that the trajectory of things like uh, Jen has mentioned changes over time. And so if we leave something alone, will it have just gotten better on its own? A lot of times it does. And so if we, if we don't do anything, it gets better as well. And that's, that's the case for a lot of things. So, um, you know, ultimately we need to consider the fact that sometimes doing nothing is just as good as 
doing something without evidence. That always reminds me of the, the, the point I make on occasion is they say there's three things that can happen in any situation. It can get better, it can get worse, or it cannot change at all. And that can be true whether you do nothing or whether you take some treatment. <laughs> so, it's very difficult to say, I did this treatment, did, did it actually help? I just actually saw a research paper on ceramides and this was published in a, in a decent uh, paper and they showed uh, that uh, people using a cream with ceramides in it made their sk skin uh, look better, look less wrinkled, but they didn't use any controls. And so to me, you know, you've got 30 people and their skin got better because they put on a cream because it had these ceramides, but how would you know? You just wouldn't know, it could have got better. So there's a lot of bad research out there that uh, isn't properly controlled and comes to conclusions that may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. now, we Even had, in pure roots. Oh. <laughs> well, we, we had a few questions that I wanted to cover before we move on to the supplement questions because I thought they were really good and I, I didn't want to mm. leave what we were talking about before uh, addressing them. So I'll just ask them all and then you guys can give your perspectives. They're all around too. So the first one is from Kizzy. Uh, you'll have to correct me if I said your name wrong. Uh, so it seems that you all agree on the fact that there's no food or bad food for everyone as a whole, but is there a food that you all agree on that's good? And then another question from Allie, uh, sorry again, uh, but the question is, is gluten and dairy bad for more people than other foods? And there is a bit of evidence around uh, uh, dairy as we talked about Andriana podcast so does that impact everyone and maybe i'll also add just because there's a lot of ideas around this about uh, chocolate is that a food to avoid does that impact acne what do you guys think i think we can all agree that coconut cream pie is the best food <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i don't know i'm more of an ice cream no, kind of girl not. myself but oh, i take coconut cream pie, pie any day so <laughs> I think a lot of times it's just human nature to want to look for the most simple answer. So it feels really good for one of us to say, eat coconut cream pie every day and you'll get this effect or you can expect this. But in reality, it's just so much more complex than that. So like favorite, like it, there is no special food that I would say, you know, eat this particular food every day and good things will happen. Um, I wish it was that simple for me to say something like that, but there just isn't evidence to say that one particular food is going to be that holy grail that we're looking for. And maybe there is an answer to that, but it's such a complicated question and people's genetics are so varied and the food you get is so varied. There's no way you could make a, a recommendation like that. Mm -hmm. I'd say it goes off of what makes you feel good. Is there something you enjoy eating every day that feels good for your body? Um, that's the food you should be eating every day. We know it's coconut cream pie for you, Perry. <laughs> if only. <laughs> the good thing I run every day. <laughs> I'd agree with that. I mean, you know, personal point of view, I, I eat everything and I drink everything. There is. I don't personally have any dietary exclusions because I think that it is about how you eat and how you drink over a long period of time. I don't think it's a day-to-day -day thing that you need to look at. So I, I agree. I don't think there is any special food that I think, oh my God, that's what I want. If you want things I like, pizza and ice cream easily, but I wouldn't <laughs> eat pizza and ice cream every day, you know, but it can be a part of my diet, just like eating some fruit can be a part of my diet. So I think that's the way that I would think about it. I, I eat and drink everything. Yeah, and I think a lot of times uh, because food relationships are often uh, quite skewed is those foods that we have to eat because they're healthy almost become a punishment and those special status foods kind of end up up here and you know when somebody tells you you can't do something all you think about is oh my god all I want to do is this and then you kind of moralize it things become good and bad you might have like a what the heck effect oh I had one bite of coconut cream pie I might as well eat the whole thing I've ruined my diet and so really when we think about um, you know, what foods we should be eating. It's, it's how foods make us feel. And just because we enjoy pizza and ice cream, 
you know, things like fruits and vegetables also help us to feel full and have regular bowel movements and uh, help us to regulate our energy and all of that sort of thing. So that's a good motivator for eating them too. But there certainly are people who uh, have dietary problems with dairy, for example. Yeah, so food intolerances happen, lactose intolerance. I myself have irritable bowel syndrome. I, I still eat all the things. I just have to be more conscious of how much I eat of them. Um, so there's nothing wrong with avoiding foods from a perspective of, okay, I, I have a diagnosis that requires me to be aware of these things. Um, for example, celiac disease, it requires a full adherence uh, restriction to gluten. Um, as opposed to, you had brought up, you know, avoiding gluten or dairy for specific skin issues. Um, I'm not aware of any evidence that supports the role of avoiding gluten for skin issues. I think the information around gluten is often overhyped. Um, a lot of the studies are quite misinformed that suggest that, uh, or overdrawn that, uh, suggest that gluten causes inflammation? Well, yes, in celiac disease it does. In certain subsets of patients with non-celiac wheat sensitivity, possibly. Uh, but for the general population, we don't need to be avoiding gluten. So I'll add a little bit more just from the skin point of view with that. So yes, yeah, so the only kind of circumstances that we've got reasonable-ish evidence is so celiac disease can cause a rash called dermatitis herpetiformis. If you have got that rash, it's incredibly itchy, tends to affect the elbows, the bottom, and it forms little blisters or little red bumps on the skin. If you stop eating gluten, that rash will clear up without any active treatment. The second area that I can think of is there is a little bit of genetic overlap in some people that have psoriasis, as well as having gluten intolerance and celiac, because there does seem to be a little bit of an overlap in those two conditions, not for everyone, but for a small percentage. So if a patient has got psoriasis, but they also describe gut symptoms as well with that, there may be some benefit in cutting out gluten because that they might be one of those overlap people where actually the gluten can be a bit of an issue. But other than that, um, I wouldn't say that there is any direct link that cutting out gluten altogether has got any benefit in the majority of skin disease. And then I think just, one, of the, oh, one of the biggest challenges just in this space is that there's so much so much written about it and anybody can write anything. I, I remembered a few years ago, there was a book that came out and it was wildly popular called Skinny Bitch, which gave just a lot of just terrible advice and it was a bestseller. <laughs> and, and people bought into this whole notion and anybody can pretty much go out and write a book about these topics and say, this food is super and it's gonna have this effect and somehow they have credibility. I, I just don't understand it. I think the problem is when you've got a chronic skin condition, you are so vulnerable and you are so desperate about what your skin looks like that you know, you'll know you try anything. You know, it, it, It's almost like I, skin disease is so visible. You, know, you could have something yeah. else wrong with you and you can hide that. It's not stigmatizing in the same way that an issue with your skin is going to be. And I, I'm sure that is a large part of what drives it. It's just this whole, desperation of I just need something I will try anything to make it better and diet becomes one of those really super easy things to try and control mm -hmm. and I think uh you know shameless plug for dietitians here but this is really where dietitians can come in and individually look at how you eat what your past medical history is and what is the least restrictive diet we can look at to see could this possibly help in this particular way um, so, you know, maybe don't get your nutrition advice from your favorite Instagrammer, but, uh, rather somebody who can provide you individualized care. Well, I think this is an important point to, uh, talk about dietitians because there's a lot of confusion about who we should be li uh, listening to, uh, for nutrition advice. And we had this conversation, Andrea, on our podcast. So if anyone wants a lot more detail, then go listen to the podcast that I recorded with Andrea. But just note there are different levels of education associated with different uh, titles. So anyone can really call themselves a nutritionist, certified nutritionist you might see, uh, registered nutritionist. Nutritionist isn't a protected title. If you want someone that has achieved a certain level of education, which will be a bachelor's plus a 
is it an internship, right? Yeah. Uh, that yeah. would be your registered dietitian. And so registered dietitians not necessarily have a BSc, but I mean, I personally gravitate towards people who have, have a science background, but either will be fine and know that they'll have adequate training and then some uh, registered dietitians even have a master's and even a PhD if you want someone who is very specialized and aware of the research out there. So just so you know, there are varying levels of education out there. Right. Uh, before you we... want to, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. You want to like, ultimately dietitians are uh, regulated professionals. Everything that comes out of my mouth when I provide one-on-one -on -one counseling, I am legally responsible for. And that is not the case on Instagram. There is crazy things that I'm like, oh my God, who would I report this to? Uh, nobody, unfortunately. Uh, so if you have somebody who is accountable for keeping up with their knowledge as well as uh, their credentials and is you know, legally responsible for the care they provide, that is gonna ensure that you get the best care possible. Uh, and then I also quickly wanted to ask one more diet related question before we move off this topic. And so this question is from Andrea saying that there is a derm on social media that suggests that we should limit fruit consumption so we avoid glycation and skin aging. Can too much natural sugar from whole fruit, not juice, actually do that? And maybe I'll just say the whole thing with sugar is complex and not so straightforward as some people make it out to be. But does anyone want to chime in? Okay, skin aging point of view then. So the idea of glycation, if you eat foods that have got lots of sugar, the sugar will bind to collagen. Collagen is that main protein in your skin that gives it support in its structure. Sugar is not supposed to bind to collagen in that way. And what will happen is if you have lots of sugar, the theory is that you can cause a, a, a process called glycation where the collagen becomes stiff and that can lead to premature skin aging by the formation of these gly advanced glycation end products or AGEs. With regards to, I mean, I'm sure Andrew will have an opinion on this as well, but, but my take on this when people ask me this question is, firstly, sugar is sugar. It's all eventually broken down to the same molecule. That's the first thing. The second thing is that does not mean that you should never ever eat sugar again. What it means is that you should be a little bit mindful about how much sugar you have. You don't want to be sitting and eating it all day, every day. But if you fancy a piece of chocolate or a piece of cake or it's your birthday and you know you, you want, I don't know, ice cream or whatever it might be, that's okay and it's not a problem because life is also for living. It's not about obsessing. You know, we're getting older from the day that we're born, literally. You know, we, we have to enjoy the things that we do. So. The answer always comes down to moderation and balance, and it's it's a boring answer. Nobody wants to hear that, but it, I think it is just, you can eat sugar, you just have to think about how much sugar you're having, because yes, it might cause premature skin aging, but your skin is still gonna age anyway for other reasons. So even if you cut the sugar out, you're not gonna prevent your sun exposure unless you go and live in a cave. You're not going to actually change the way that your cells metabolize simply by the aging biological process that is going on. So. Yeah, that's my answer in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I definitely would agree with that. I, I believe a lot of the research is also around excess sugar. And this message that I'm hearing about fruit is really an absolutist kind of approach. Uh, again, it's not all or nothing. Um, I don't think we need to, we definitely don't need to be avoiding fruit. I'll just put that out there. Um, but when it comes to like added sugars, like desserts and treats and that sort of thing, yeah, we do want to be mindful and strike that balance um, around particular numbers of added sugar. So this isn't naturally occurring of like fruit and dairy, uh, added sugars. Uh, the, the WHO suggests, you know, max 50 to 75 grams of added sugar a day. And so we can still enjoy our treats um, and we can still have our naturally occurring sugar in fruits and vegetables and carbohydrates and all of that. Uh, we don't need to take this absolutist avoid all sugar approach because like An uh, Angelie said, it turns into glucose anyways. Everything, every carbohydrate breaks down into glucose or fructose, so. I think one thing that's important to note though is um, natural fruit juices are really high in sugar. So while you can't eat too many, uh, you know, apples, you can drink too much apple juice. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, that's right. Juicing um, a little bit different because we're, again, removing a lot of that fiber, that food matrix that infers that health benefit. So I, and, I definitely- And just the numbers, right? Because you know, a, a glass of orange juice is going to take, I don't know, 10, 12 oranges. You would never eat that many oranges. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting also, actually, from a skin disease point of view, particularly with conditions like acne and this idea of eating foods that have got a high refined sugar content, a high GI index. One of the things that I'm seeing a lot of is people seem to think it, it's healthier to firstly stop dairy and then switch to a plant based milk. And it seems to be that like so many of the people that I see switch to oat milk. But if you look at the GI index of oat milk, it's actually pretty high. If anything, it's actually higher than dairy milk. So you're also not doing yourself any favors because there's this idea of like, well, dairy is bad, but if I switch to any plant-based milk, it'll somehow be better for me. But actually, if you look at the GI index of these things, it doesn't quite add up in that way either. So now to move on to supplements and we'll still be taking more questions after we, if we have time, we've been already talking for 40 minutes and we're only supposed to talk for an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, but the, the next question will be around uh, supplements. And before we dive into specific supplements for the skin, we should probably cover supplements in general. So what are they? How are they regulated? And what are some of the important considerations for consumers? Perry, do you want to start? Sure. And I should just mention that I'm U.S. centric. So the information I pass along is relevant mostly in the U.S., although around the world that we face sort of the similar problems. So in the U.S., supplements are regulated by the FDA and the FDA defines supplements as products that are intended to add further nutritional value, basically to supplement people's diets. Um, so they aren't drugs. Um, so they're not regulated as drugs. Um, they are just simply uh, food products that are regulated in a different way. Now, now drugs have to go through drug trials and they have to show safety testing and you have to validate your claims. Uh, supplements aren't like that at all. You know, only when you're able to show that a supplement is going to cause significant harm, that's when the FDA can do anything. Now, the specific regulation that, that wasn't always the case with the uh, with the supplements in the United States, but uh, in around 1994, um, the the U.S. dietary supplement industry they essentially got um, Congress to pass a law called the Deshay Law, and that's that severely limits the power of the FDA that they have to regulate dietary supplements. Uh, now they do have the ability, as I said, to recall products. Uh, but as long as you're not making medical claims, and as long as you put a disclaimer on there that says the, the claims have not been substantiated by the FDA, you can pretty much sell what you want. In, in my view, the manufacturers have been uh, tasked with being able to prove that uh, they have to guarantee that their product's safe, and they have to guarantee that what they're saying is true. Uh, the FDA just does not have very much power to, to actually enforce any of those laws. And the FDA can't um, enforce anything until after the product has been put on the market. Uh, that, is, uh, that is similar in a way to the cosmetic industry here in the United States, where uh, we don't regulate stuff before we go onto the market, although over-the-counter drugs you do. But as far as supplements go, you know, pretty much anybody could go in their kitchen, mix up a batch of pills and start selling them on Etsy. And it's frightening if you ask me. Uh, there was actually an excellent podcast called The Dream and they did their whole second season was taking a look at specifically how the, uh, the supplement industry drummed up support to get passage of this Deshay law. And essentially what they did is they scared people and uh, they had uh, Mel Gibson actually had a commercial here on in the United States where it showed him uh, holding a bottle of vitamins and the government people were pointing guns at him and scaring everybody. And they were able to get uh, this Deshay Act passed, which essentially says to the FDA, uh, we're taking away all your regulatory power for supplements. And unless uh, you can demonstrate that we've killed somebody, you can't really do anything. <laughs> so it's it's quite, uh, quite frightening. And I will add that the power that the FDA does have isn't really effective. In 2014, there was a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that showed that about two thirds of the FDA recalled dietary supplements 
uh, that they analyzed, they had banned drugs in them and they were still on the market six months after being recalled. So um, the FDA, while they have some powers of regulation, uh, it's pretty much in the United States anyway, the wild, wild west when it comes to what is in your supplement. It could be uh, contaminated, it could be not, it could be what it says on the bottle that's in there. It could be spiked with uh, extra drug ingredients that haven't been uh, analyzed. And uh, I, I find it very unnerving and I don't recommend that consumers even take uh, any kind of supplements unless it's prescribed specifically from a doctor. That is terrifying. <laughs> And in Canada, we also have, a, we have a little bit of a different way of doing things. And we are considered around the world kind of like the gold standard for supplements, which are natural health products. So Andrea, do you want to take yeah. NHPs? Yeah. So in Canada, thank goodness, um, we are, uh, all supplements are regulated through the natural health products um, and uh, the Health Canada and CFIA. And so basically all products need to be licensed with an NPM number. So when you pick up a bottle, it should have an NPM number on it. And that NPM number shows you that it's been assessed for quality, safety, and efficacy. And um, so basically there's a lot of regulations around what is allowed to be said on a bottle, the specific claims around the active ingredients. Um, and uh, you know, if somebody, does have a product and does want to bring research forward, I believe they need to have three clinical trials that show benefit before a claim can be made. So for example, um, a prebiotic company needs to show three research trials uh, that are randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials that have benefit before a claim can be made. Then Health Canada looks at all the evidence and says, yeah, we agree with this claim you can make this claim or no, you have to say a, a claim in this particular way. So it's highly regulated. Um, so in terms of claims, each ingredient can have a specific claim. So I jotted a few down for examples for you guys. Um, for example, you know, biotin, popular skin supplement. Uh, it can claim on the label that it helps to maintain healthy hair, nail, mucous membranes and or skin helps to prevent biotin deficiency, helps to maintain the body's ability to metabolize nutrients. And so my problem with these claims is then the assumption is, is if I take this, it's going to help my hair, skin and nails. When in fact, it's if you're deficient, this nutrient is required to help ensure uh, hair, skin and nail um, uh, development and maintenance. And so I sometimes see a lot of people extrapolating what might be on uh, a bottle to have a specific benefit and overstating that. But in general, I'd say Canada's regulations are a lot better in terms of what people are and aren't allowed to say. Now, just for clarification, with uh, from my understanding, as long as you follow these monographs in Canada, so say you're using vitamin C, which according to that like st approved structure and function claim, it helps uh, support a healthy immune system. I mean, ask yourself like, what does that mean? Uh, and like, how is that going to be perceived to consumers? Uh, but say you're using vitamin C at this approved level, then you can launch a product without any specific clinical trials on the product, but you're using it in the uh, clinically effective uh, by the government standard um, dosage or with a clinically effective ingredient specifically. Can you right. expand on that? Um, yes, I think, you know, that is, that is the, they have like a list of ingredients that you can look up that you can use to make that claim. And it has to be within a specific dose. So my experience specifically is around probiotics. There's very specific strains that can be identified as probiotic. And there's very specific uh, claims that they can make helped to support a healthy gut flora, I think is the claim off the top of my head. Um, but it has to be that specific strain. The company has had to show that that, uh, that probiotic survives transit through the GI tract. Um, 
So yes, you can pull an ingredient with that specific dose and make that claim. Uh, that individual supplement doesn't necessarily need to be tested. That to me is kind of concerning, um, but I mean my own perspective. So we could be talking about this for a really long time and there's obviously a lot of different opinions out there uh, about supplements in general. And I'll just say like, Sometimes there's a time and a place, but maybe not as often as people think, uh, such as say you have a deficiency, then maybe that, uh, sorry, I'm probably taking some of your answers right now. No, that's perfect. <laughs> but my next question will be first directed to Anjali. Um, so skin supplements are trending. Are they all they're hyped up to be? If you look at the majority of skin supplements, they always contain the same ingredients usually there's always a bit of vitamin a in there somewhere there's always a little bit of selenium a bit of zinc a bit of omega-3 and it's a combination of these and whilst all of these things are again really important to skin integrity and health if you haven't got a lack of these things there is very little evidence that giving yourself more is going to be better for your skin health or treat your skin in disease the second thing with a lot of these supplements is you, you also don't know what their long-term safety is because of the way that they are regulated or not regulated. So you shouldn't be taking excess vitamin A, for example, if you're trying to conceive and you're pregnant. If you're taking high levels of biotin, there've been plenty of case reports now in a lot of dermatology journals, which will talk about the fact that high levels of biotin will interfere with other assays. So they can cause misreading of enzymes involved in measuring whether or not you've had a heart attack so you could end up effectively missing a heart attack or misdiagnosing it if somebody's taking high levels of biotin and it's happened. You could also get problems with another blood assay with thyroid problems. So it can lead to issues with diagnosing other medical issues, even though you think this is a completely harmless thing that you're taking. So my general take on skin supplements, particularly for, for beauty, and this is not even collagen, I'm talking purely about the ones that are supposed to be good for acne or good for general health, if you're not deficient and if you can get it from your diet, it is always better from your diet than from a supplement. Does anyone want to add on to that? I'm not sure if there is I think much she nailed add. it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I would be curious uh, with the panel here, does anybody regularly take supplements? I, I'll, I'll start. I don't take any supplements uh, unless, I'm, unless it gets prescribed and I haven't been prescribed a supplement in any time I've ever remembered. I take a um, functional food, I guess. I eat probiotics and yogurt um, for my irritable bowel syndrome. There's a particular strain that has evidence to support improved transit time. That is, oh, and sometimes vitamin D in the winter, but I always forget. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very sunny here a lot of times. Yeah. yeah, vitamin D was what I was gonna say. I have vitamin D, but I rarely remember to take it. But I think that, Interestingly, vitamin D is one of the ones that I think that with lockdown at the moment, I suspect most people are probably deficient right now. So I think that that is one that might be of benefit, not just to your skin, but to your general health. I also think for a lot of the patients that I would see, vitamin D is probably useful um, to be taking, partly because if you've had a previous skin cancer, you're going to be looking after your skin and avoiding your sun exposure. So there is also a chance there that your levels are likely to be low. If you've got skin of color, you've got black skin, you've got Asian skin, it takes longer for your skin to make vitamin D from the sun, so there's a benefit there. But also, there are studies that show that people that have got eczema and psoriasis, their baseline vitamin D levels do tend to be lower. And there are studies that show, particularly in eczema, that if you optimize vitamin D levels, you can improve quality of life scores, you can also improve the rate of infection that may occur, but also you can improve the sort of scoring that we look at for redness as well. So I think vitamin D is a useful one that most of us can probably benefit from. But from a practical point of view, I, I often forget to take mine as well. Super forgetful with that. Yeah, uh, indeed. indeed. <laughs> uh, and Anjali, you brought up, I mean, 
obviously there are risks associated sometimes with uh, taking supplements and you brought up vitamin A as one example. If we remember in history lessons how many sailors died, were they eating livers of whales and they had a vitamin A toxicity because it is a fat soluble vitamin. So just so you know, there is sometimes risk associated with certain supplements when you get too much, if, especially if it's a fat soluble uh, vitamin, if that's what you're taking. But probably now would be a good time because I'm sure a lot of the uh, viewers are wondering about specific examples. There are many popular supplements out there and you've covered quite a few already, but maybe we'll start with the one that I feel like is mo most popular on social media. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's collagen. So what is the evidence around it? Is it actually going to impact the wrinkles on our face? What do you think? Or whatever else it's being claimed to do. Collagen was actually one of the, when I started doing the beauty brains way back in 2006, I think collagen was one of the first products that uh, we were sent. Uh, there was a company, I, I think the brand name was Imidine and they had sent along with samples of the, their collagen, uh, a, a published study, which demonstrated that this, and it was a double blind study, placebo controlled. And it demonstrated that in fact, after six weeks and 12 weeks of taking this collagen supplement, uh, people's skin did look better. Um, I was very skeptical of it. I just start very skeptical, uh, but there was that study. I would look at that, however, and say, you know, if something is statistically significant to a 95% confidence interval, there's still a one in 20 chance that that was just lucky. <laughs> so um, that, and then, not not seeing um, a deluge of other studies demonstrating collagen's effectiveness. That's just one piece of evidence compared to all the rest. And I, I don't think uh, the evidence that I've seen that taking collagen supplements really gets to the level where it's a recommendation that people are going to see a benefit of taking that over just using a topical uh, moisturizing cream. I think that's the difficulty, isn't it? A lot of the studies are very small. They're always industry funded. So there is that conflict of interest that immediately comes to mind. Often the methods they use aren't fantastic either. Right. So those are the basic things that we worry about. Then let's just say that they do come up with a positive result. The issue then becomes, well, if you had a 0 0.001 millimeter improvement in that one wrinkle, is that clinically significant anyway? Who would notice that? And if it's not a noticeable difference, why would you bother? And then the biggest thing is, if you're the kind of person that is worried about premature skin aging, and you're worried about the fact that you know your skin is getting older, therefore you're buying these supplements, you're able to afford to do so, that means there's a large number of socioeconomic factors you need to consider. Chances are that person is already wearing sunscreen, they're probably already using their vitamin A, they've probably already got a pretty good lifestyle in terms of health, sleep, nutrition, then how do we know it's not any one of those other factors rather than actually that collagen supplement in that small study that was industry funded that showed a minute amount of difference in the skin. So I am also highly, highly skeptical. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I echo all of that. And ultimately, you know, the collagen we take orally, we can't, you know, say, hey body, use this collagen to uh, direct this collagen towards, uh, you know, proper uh, skin function. Yeah. We, our body may use that collagen for other things. So uh, proteins, proteins, protein. If you're getting enough through the diet, you probably don't need an additional supplement. It's interesting as well. There's a couple of supplements I've seen being advertised. We know, we know in the skin, your, your majority of your collagen is your type one, your type three. And I've seen some type two and four collagen supplements being pushed for skin health. And again, you're just like, even if that was likely to work, that really wouldn't be the choice of collagen you would want in your skin anyway. So it is interesting actually how the, the marketing has run away without actually that basic science as often seems to happen in both nutrition and cosmetics. Well, it is a compelling and logical story, right? You say, oh, uh, you do need good collagen and elastin for building your skin up. So if you eat it, then you'll get it. You know, it, it's, it, there's a logic to it, but just because something's logical doesn't mean it's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so another popular supplement type, there's lots out there and you guys have kind of talked to a few of them, but antioxidants. So antioxidants, what's the evidence for 
these types of supplements and how they'll impact the skin. Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, antioxidants in our diet protect our skin from damage and protect us from free radicals, but more isn't better. Like Anjali mentioned, there's mm. risks of having too much vitamin A. There's risks of having too much vitamin E. Um, there, there's risks of having too much vitamin C from a gut perspective. So uh, ultimately, when it comes to antioxidants, my biggest message is through the diet. We can get enough vitamin A by choosing brightly colored orange, yellow, red fruit and veg, broccoli and spinach, dark green vegetables. We can get our vitamin A through choosing plant-based oils and consuming nuts and seeds. Uh, we can get all those antioxidants through our food and supplements won't necessarily infer a benefit. They may infer a risk. That's right, because we don't know which antioxidant supplement is best. We don't know what dose we should be using. We also don't really know, you know, which agents and which specific one is going to be the best one for X problem or Y problem. And I think the thing that worries me with them in general, when you're taking them in such super high doses that you would get from an oral supplement is we don't know if it is potentially like in some studies showing that actually it is impacting tumor growth rather than reducing tumor size. And that's something that concerns me. You know, I think we just don't have the data and the whole supplement field. Like, are we gonna find out in like 30, 40 years time that actually people taking supplements at this moment in time has actually severely led to an increased risk of all sorts of cancers we don't know about. I think one of the most damaging things that happened uh, was the scientist Linus Pauling, who Nobel Prize, brilliant, he turned into a complete quack on the whole notion of vitamin C. And that was in the early 1970s. And uh, that has stuck around. Uh, people still have this notion, well, if, you know, 100 milligrams of vitamin C is good, 10,000 is better. <laughs> and um, I think that's been very damaging. And marketers of supplements have taken information like that from scientists and from legitimate scientists. And they've run with it and they've, uh, they take a little bit of science they expand it, put it into a product, and uh, make claims that aren't supported by the little kernel of science that it is based on. Yeah, and that baseline patient cohort as well that might be taking something, there might be a group of people that may benefit. And then there's a difference between treating something and preventing something, and then the age group. There are so many factors that like one needs to think about, even if that supplement did work, or yeah. do what it said on the tin, so to speak. And fun fact, I used to work prior to getting into the uh, cosmetic space and the natural health space. And there was this uh, sales rep trainer from a specific vitamin C company that's very popular uh, who used Linus Pauling as like, see, this Nobel laureate <laughs> <laughs> uh, says that uh, vitamin C is effective. And then all the sales reps go and tell all the natural health stores across Canada this information and that information is given to consumers. I think that is an important uh, thing to take away, though. Just because someone is brilliant and expert in one field doesn't mean that they're brilliant and expert in some other field. And diets and supplements, uh, these are very complicated subjects where the science that we have is very incomplete. And any evidence or any uh, advice you're getting from people, you know, it might not apply to you. In the next supplement that we'll talk about, maybe Andrea's favorite, uh, probiotics. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the supplements yeah. around, pro or what's the evidence around probiotics? Yeah, so ultimately, you know, uh, our gut microbiome encompasses viruses, bacteria, and fungi. And in the last 10 years, research around this field has really grown, but we have to be cautious in looking at it in that, we're seeing a lot of associative data, which is a great place to start, but people are taking it and running with it. And um, so probiotics are basically live bacteria that when consumed in adequate amounts and for a benefit to our health. And so probiotics really should be strain specific. We wanna match the right person to the right strain for the right reason. It's not like, it's. I always explain it like drugs. You don't go to the pharmacy and say, I need a drug. I'm just going to pick up any drug to prevent pregnancy. And you pick up Tylenol. Well, we know that's not going to prevent pregnancy. Same thing with probiotic strains. You're not just going to pick up any probiotic strain and expect it to have a benefit for your skin, for example. 
And so right now, the current literature that exists around skin and probiotics, um, there are a few small studies to suggest that very specific strains of probiotics may be helpful in atopic dermatitis in pediatrics. But other than that, most of the data is uh, really heterogeneous at this point. A lot of studies are using a lot of different strains, a lot of different doses. Some studies don't even list the strain, they just list the species. So it's really hard for us to know at this point how we can utilize probiotics for our skin. And so I see a lot of, you know, anecdotal evidence out there or recommendations around just take a probiotic for your acne or take a probiotic for this. Anyone will do with lactobacillus or bifidobacterium. But the reality is, is that's not how probiotics work. We need to have a very specific strain and then we need to understand, um, you know, how that specific strain influences one specific condition. So bottom line at this point, there isn't a lot of evidence to suggest probiotics for most skin conditions, with the exception that there may be some weak evidence for a specific strain of probiotics in uh, pediatric atopic dermatitis and eczema. Would you agree? So <laughs> I, I, yes, I, I pretty much would agree with that. So the, the one kind of area I can think of, and it, it directly relates to what you've just said, but certain strains of probiotics given to women during their second and third trimester of pregnancy, if they've got a high risk of eczema or their child developing eczema because they have it, you can reduce the risk of that child developing eczema further down the line. But that doesn't mean that if every pregnant lady took probiotics, their child would not have eczema. It's a very specific population that you're talking about that is already high risk to begin with, that there may be some benefits. The second thing is, you know, that probiotics are always targeted really to the gut microbiome. And that's where a lot of the studies come from. And then that data gets extrapolated to the skin, but the skin's got its own microbiome. And what we still don't know is how the gut and the skin microbiome cross speak and interact with each other. There's still so much about the skin microbiome in both health and disease that we don't know about that I entirely agree. A lot of what we see, it's, it's so oversimplistic that we're lacking so much data on those two separate microbiomes and then how they interact with each other as well. And then topical probiotics, I mean, that, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah, it really blows my mind that we're taking studies where we see, oh, there's a difference in patients with acne. We see, you know, an increased ratio of firmicutes to bacteroidetes. Yeah. And then we take that and run with it. But yeah. your gut microbiome is an ecosystem and presence doesn't mean function. So all of those microbiome tests are not helpful in deciding how to treat your acne. So the other thing is, it's almost like a drop in the ocean as well for how much you've already got living there and then what you're taking on top of that as well. Right, yeah, yeah. So maybe we'll just skim past. Uh, we were going to talk about zinc and biotin, but I feel like we've kind of covered it. If you get it through your diet, you're probably going to be good. Uh, and if anyone has specific questions in the comments, feel free. And maybe if you guys don't agree with me, then feel free to correct me. But I think you guys agree with me. Uh, so two more supplements before I start asking more of the uh, uh, viewer questions. So the first one will be uh, fish oil. Um, should we be taking those for a healthier looking skin? Okay, so generally for me, again, what I will say with this, so skin condition called rosacea, um, a, a certain percentage of people that have rosacea can get eye symptoms and they can get ocular rosacea. And there is a little bit of data that suggests that if you have got ocular rosacea and you take high levels of omega-3 supplements, that can improve the dryness and the irritation that can be associated with it. That doesn't directly extrapolate to the skin because it's very specific to the eyes. So again, as a general rule, what I would tell my patients is if you can get it from your diet, that's really where you want to. You know, the narrative that's often pushed is omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. And if you've got an, anti an inflammatory skin condition, if you take high levels of omega-3, which we tend to lack in a Western diet, which is high in omega-6 and 9, there can be 
some benefit in doing that. But from a practical point of view, you know, I usually say, unless my patients have got ocular rosation, I say you might benefit from that. The second instance where I recommend that people may take an omega-3 supplement is there are also, there's one study with smallish numbers that shows that if people are taking a drug called Accutane or Roaccutane for their skin, and they're getting a lot of mucous membrane side effects and so lots of problems with dryness, omega-3 does seem to reduce their experience of that. So that's a second place where I will say you might benefit from it. But as a general rule for somebody with completely healthy skin, I will say, get it from your diet. And for a specific skin disease, other than the two things that I've mentioned, I don't tend to recommend patients take the supplements. Yeah, I'm of the same mind as well as um, there's a lot of different food ways we can add it in. And with adding in food sources of omega-3s, you're inherently going to get a lot of those other good for your skin nutrients too. So um, I always say get in two servings of fish a week, ideally fatty fish like salmon, tuna, mackerel, um, sardines. Uh, if you're not a big fish for person, you can get in uh, omega-3 uh, fortified eggs um, or nuts and seeds can also be a source of omega-3. So specifically things like flaxseed, walnuts, chia seeds uh, also contain omega-3. So fish twice a week, uh, omega-3 eggs, they're a little bit more expensive. So obviously it's going to be whether you can afford them or not. And then plant-based oils and nuts and seeds. And that's specifically for, that'll be good for your health. I mean, not specifically your skin, but if your health is good, your skin will be good. Jim. Yeah, that's perfect. I think um, a lot of the literature around fish oil is showing that long-term, the supplements don't have benefit in reducing cardiovascular risk but consuming fish does. So, yeah. And my last supplement that we'll, I'll ask you about, and it seems to be really trendy right now, uh, oral SPF. Yay or nay, what do you think? Well, wouldn't that be the coolest thing? I mean, who doesn't, who, who likes to put that sunscreen on? Yeah. It's just <laughs> terrible. Uh, I, I, if, if there was one that actually worked, I think this would be great. Uh, I haven't seen any evidence that there is anything that really works in a, a reasonable way. Right. It's always your, your lycopene, your astaxanthin, your omega-3 that tend to get bandied about for this. And yes, there are small studies mainly on animals, mainly in the lab that will show that they can reduce something called your minimal erythema dose, your MED. So how quickly your skin will get red, basically, as a result of ultraviolet light. That doesn't, and what these studies show is that it might prolong the time it takes for your skin to get red as a result of receiving this radiation. But that doesn't mean that it's blocking out sunlight. So the safest way to reduce your risk of skin cancer and to reduce your risk of premature skin aging is to make sure not just the sunscreen, but it's all the other healthy sun seeking behaviors. She seeking shade, you know, wearing protective clothing, hat, sunglasses, Ideally, not using tanning beds. You know, all of those <laughs> things really are so much more important than worrying about oral SPF. But boy, it would be cool if we could get that. <laughs> well, it kind of seems like they're like skirting regulations. I guess it really depends on where yeah. you are because regulations for sunscreen products are different around the world. But in Canada and the United States, uh, Canada, they're either NPN or DI, uh, drug. Uh, and then in the States, they're drug products. I'm assuming yep. they don't have to get drug approval for this, especially because of their potential lack of efficacy. And perhaps there is some consumer risk for consumers having a false confidence in the oral mm -hmm. SPF that they're taking. What do you think? I think that's one of the reasons that you see a rise in the beauty from within trend and uh, you know, regular cosmetic companies coming out with supplement products or vitamin waters and that sort of thing is because they can make stronger claims that they don't have to support as difficultly as say a cosmetic claim. And so the regulations are a lot grayer there and people are more accepting. So you could make claims about uh, improving wrinkles by drinking this, uh, this specialized water in a way that you couldn't do uh, by using a topical cream. It's the, the required claims are a lot different. I feel like this product wouldn't be allowed in Canada based on our regulatory framework. I don't think so. <laughs> and in the in the U.S., uh, it depends on how you make the claim. But you know, if you put it on the market 
and implied that it uh, could protect you from the sun, uh, somebody could get away with that for a little while at least. Anjali, do you have any thoughts on this to add before I start asking questions from the viewers? No, I think I've said most of it. The only thing that occurred to me that was just slightly separate, but I'm going to say it whilst I, I don't forget, is there is one more instance I will recommend a supplementing clinic, and that is um, nicotinamide. And there is good data that shows that if you take nicotinamide twice daily, 500 milligrams, if you have got a history of previous non-melanoma skin cancers, it can increase your risk of further non-melanoma skin cancers. That effect only seems to exist if you remain on it. If you stop the supplementation, it seems to all go back to normal and baseline. But if you've had non-melanoma skin cancers like a basal cell or a squamous cell, and you remain at risk, you've had lots of sun exposure, you're fair skinned, there might be some benefit in taking nicotinamide. And to the questions from our audience. So the first one is from Andrea, and so she asks, but provided we need to be in a caloric deficit and have problems with meeting all our nutritional needs through our food, can a multivitamin be beneficial? Yeah, so in certain states, specifically malnutrition or a caloric deficit, if you're not able to meet your micronutrients by way of food, then that multivitamin mineral supplement would bridge that gap to what is considered, you know, the recommended daily allowance or the amount we should be aiming for in terms of uh, actual body needs. Um, on that note, though, like if you are on a calorie restricted diet and you're not sure if you're getting enough micronutrients, that's what a dietitian is for, is really taking a look at is there ways we can optimize the diet to meet your needs rather than relying on a supplement or should we add that supplement on to correct any deficiencies? Um, yeah, and then of course there's there's malabsorptive type conditions or conditions in which a person might need a uh, multivitamin plus mineral. Pregnancy is a great example of when your physiological needs are higher and a multivitamin mineral supplement is uh, recommended. So it is very individual. On, on that note, actually, one thing I'm seeing is a lot of people have switched to a vegan diet, particularly in the last 12 to 18 months that I see in clinic, and nearly all of them have very low iron. Uh, and one thing I'm noticing is the hair is, is thinning and it's shedding. Um, low iron levels are a very common cause of, of hair loss in women anyway. So I think absolutely, you know, if, you, if you're on a, a diet, which is, for example, a very plant based diet, it's not even vegan, but, rel, you know, relatively high in plant based rather than anything else you probably would benefit, particularly from iron, from a hair point of view. Mm -hmm. B12 as well, too. And then another question, which I found really interesting from Laura. So there's a beauty company now selling beauty devices along with antioxidant supplements. They can scan your skin every three months and tell you how much antioxidants in, are in your skin. And by knowing that, tell if your skin is more healthy what do you think about this? And she added, uh, how can we debunk these statements? Uh, but what do you think about it? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a really fancy way to convince you to buy products. <laughs> uh, these tools aren't validated. Um, you know, ultimately there's been, no, I'm not aware of any research where you can scan your skin to assess the antioxidant level, nor is there any research that I'm aware of that that's even a measurement of skin health, but maybe you guys can elaborate. I mean, how do we define skin health? You know, that's, that's the other thing. What, what are they using as their marker for health or quality? Is it the elasticity? Is it the, I don't know, the water content? I mean, who knows? So I would be highly skeptical. Mary from Vet Cosmetics added in the comment that she believes if this oral SPF stuff comes in France, our control authority would become crazy. Are they approved in any other market other than the United States? Does anyone know offhand? Uh, I don't think they'd be allowed in Canada. And I, I should say that those types of things are not approved in the United States. It's just that you can, you know, Fine. if you sell a product like that and you're not harming anybody, nobody's going to stop you. 
So we've been talking now for an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> I can talk to you guys for a real long time, but this is probably a good place to start to close the conversation. So I guess before we go, do you have any final take homes that you'd like to leave our viewers with? Or maybe some suggestions to industry? Uh, I get kind of frustrated when I see all the marketing, especially in like industry magazines around supplements for skin health. Uh, I think it's a little irresponsible. I guess that's my take home, but uh, what do you guys think? Any final take homes that you'd like to leave our viewers with? I think generally, if you can get it from your diet, then from a supplement, it's better unless you have got a specific nutritional deficiency, particularly, you know, for your skin and for your general health. I want people to know uh, just a couple of things. First of all, you know, if you eat uh, food that you think is bad, there isn't bad food that uh, you can eat too much of things. But uh, if you have a candy bar every so often <laughs> and a bottle of pop, uh, that's OK. Uh, so you shouldn't feel guilty about the, the food that you're eating. Uh, now, but if you're having health problems, then, uh, yeah, you should adjust your diet. But uh, here and there, you don't don't have to avoid specific things. The other thing I want people to know is there is no magic supplement that is going to improve your skin or hair. There, you don't need to spend uh, $80 a month on the latest supplement that's uh, going to really refresh you. It's probably not giving you uh, much benefit, and certainly it's overpriced. Um, you know, the bottom line is that uh, supplement companies are not regulated very well. There is some danger in it, and the benefits are uh, not proven and scant at best. Yeah, and I think uh, on that note, I completely understand people's desire to seek answers to things that maybe they don't have full answers to, and I, I feel for you. I mean, I have melasma. I totally understand that that's really frustrating. Um, and. I just want people to understand that, you know, there's a team of people out there that can help to guide your decisions and say, hey, you know, this is where the evidence at, is at, and this is really what's realistic when it comes to nutrition and supplements. You don't have to just look online, ask your dermatologist, ask your dietitian, ask your pharmacist um, to help clarify so you can make decisions that are best for you. I would also like to add that when you're, if you're getting information, educational information from somebody who is trying to sell you something, <laughs> be very skeptical of that. Uh, so even if they're a dermatologist or they have a great background, uh, if they're benefiting financially from you buying a product, uh, look for uh, verification anyway on the things that they're telling you. Well, thank you. Or Dr. buy my supplement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you to all of our panelists and all of the viewers who sat through and especially the ones who sent in great questions for the conversation. So just a reminder, this conversation is going to be published right away on our YouTube channel and eventually it's going to make its way onto our podcast. And we're currently deciding on the topic for our next e-conference, which will be in like two or three weeks. There's some topics in the air, maybe like, hair care, cruelty free. If you guys have any ideas, then leave those in the comments. If you guys have any further questions that we didn't cover this or cover in the video, then leave them into the in the comments. I'm sorry, I've been talking for so long. I guess I haven't really been talking. I've been watching, but sorry for stumbling. Um, leave them in the comments and I'll try my best to answer them. And if I can't, then I'll take one of our panelists or someone else who might be able to. But thank you again to all of our panelists and for everyone who tuned in. Everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.